one of the professors, Mike McKean, who was doing all the new media stuff at Mizzou and basically structured with him what a new media journalism Hello everyone, today our guest is Swan Bitcoin CEO and investor Corey Clipston. In this video, Corey Clipston talks about his journey, the importance of Bitcoin crypto scams, and the fundamental flaws in the current financial system. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Michael Saylor the co-founder and executive chairman of American business intelligence firm MicroStrategy, has shared what he thinks will happen to Bitcoin in the next eight years while outlining how it will come into play. In a recent interview with Corey Clipston, the founder and CEO of Swan Bitcoin, Saylor noted that he sees Bitcoin becoming a global store of value by 2031. According to him, institutional adoption is one of the first drivers of the digital assets' global store of value status in the coming years. The Bitcoin proponent believes institutional adoption is possible through the utterances of the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and decisions by traditional financial institutions. Saylor mentioned some traditional financial institutions, such as BlackRock and Fidelity, that are beginning to embrace Bitcoin in recent times due to its potential despite previously distancing themselves from the asset. Why Bitcoin, not crypto? You can summarize it by saying that only Bitcoin is deserving of a monetary premium. And so thus far, we humans have only found one thing that works, that needs a blockchain, that needs a time chain, and it's money. And Bitcoin dominates all of the altcoins across a whole host of potential criteria uh, as a better money than they are. Mm -hmm. um, and this comes from, from being first, it comes from being immutable, it comes from having a, a, a culture of forward compatibility, which is like using soft forks instead of hard forks. Like there are a whole host of reasons why Bitcoin is better and more trustworthy than any altcoin can be. Mm -hmm. It's possible that in the earliest years, maybe 2010, maybe 2011, that another project could have done it and could have superseded Bitcoin. Conditional upon that not happening, I would say by 2012 or 2013, the race was over mm -hmm. and that it was impossible for a new cryptocurrency to beat Bitcoin at the game of being money. What are these other currencies then? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're based on cryptography, right? You need a digital signature. They have a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So what makes it what makes it different? Yeah, so they're just not actually decentralized. So uh, there's a common uh, acronym. They say Dino, decentralized in name only, um, and that's what you see with things like Ethereum that hard fork regularly. You know, based on management decisions or you know, completely change their consensus algorithm. So now you've got like a completely new currency and the old one is gone. And, you know, so any, any, any sort of longevity or as they say, the Lindy effect of how, you know, you can trust something more the longer it's not been changed. Um, you know, you kind of start from, start from zero again when you change everything. And you do that every time you hard fork, which, you know, all of these, com all of these, I was gonna say companies, all of these, <laughs> these companies really do that um, right. with, the, with these altcoin projects. Um, and then this idea that there's, you know, something going on in like, you know, Web3 or blockchain, like that, it's easy enough just to look at, you know, none of them need a token. So the price for running a decentralized application historically, and all we can really see in present is running a node on that network. You don't actually need something else. If you did need to pay for something, you can just use dollars or Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You don't need your own friction token, your own Chuck E. Cheese token right. that only works in this ecosystem. And if you did require that for some reason, there's absolutely no reason for someone that needs to use that to hold it outside of that right. system because there are better stores of value. Right. So even if you do need to use this, you know, you know, yeah. S coin, ship coin, as Matt Crowder says, if you need to use a ship coin inside of an ecosystem, there's still no reason to hold it. As money, um, right? As money, exactly. The good thing about uh, being such a strong voice uh, for Bitcoiners is that you end up with a lot of customers that, uh, that like to buy Bitcoin on sale. So when the price crashes, we usually do really, really well. 
Um, so that's actually been fine for us from sort of like a volume and revenue perspective. Um, we're turning into a pretty diversified Bitcoin financial services company. So there is the retail side, obviously, with Swan.com and the Swan app, which you mm -hmm. should definitely download and use on, on iOS and Android. Um, and then we also have uh, sort of the other side of the house that internally we're calling it Swan Global Wealth, but it's basically uh, Swan Private Client Services, Swan Advisor. So it's private. Swan Private is for uh, global high net worth individuals around the world and companies. Um, and then Swan Advisor is for RAs and FAs to help them get their clients into Bitcoin. And that's a platform that's available for, uh, for wealth managers throughout the US. And then we have other things that we're now using our distribution and our sales team so like just you know the voice that we have with our events and our shows and just the network of being able to say hey this is the thing mm -hmm. all of you other bitcoin podcasts and macro podcasts this is the thing we vouch for it you can have them as guests so it's like a really good platform to to launch a product so now we have the bitcoin opportunity fund uh, which we're obviously heavily involved in with uh with james lavish and greg foss and and uh and that crew um and then we have um, Swan Home Equity, which we're doing in, in partnership with um, uh, a couple of guys with deep experience in, in that world in, in mortgage lending and financing. Um, and there will be more. You know, there's, there's another fund we're in diligence with right now that I think we'll probably bring to the platform. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. And then, you know, there, there are other services that we'll bring to market over time. You know, we, we did acquire Spectre. So Spectre Wallet, Spectre Solutions um, earlier this earlier last year, I guess. Um, so we'll be doing a lot more around multi-sig and around sort of institutional custody and things mm -hmm. like that over time as well. We've got the Bitcoin IRA, uh, Swan IRA. Um, we've got the Bitcoin Benefit Plan where a lot of companies give all of their employees Bitcoin every month. I know we enjoy that gift every month as, right. a, as a fringe benefit. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, you stack up a lot of different products and services um, that are mm -hmm. directly selling Bitcoin, but also Bitcoin related. Uh, and I think you can, you can build a pretty large company on that. I mean, yeah, so some people are well-intentioned or think they have good intentions and are just mistaken. And that's a small subset of these types. Uh, Do Kwan was actually a malicious criminal and Alex Mashensky was a malicious criminal. Yeah. Um, so his backstory is basically all falsified. Uh, I even hopped on a call with him and Daniel Leon. This is uh, Shlomo Daniel Leon. That's also, you know, one of the executives that have pulled hundreds of millions of dollars out of Celsius over the last few years yeah. um, just to line their own pockets. And I hopped on a call with them in like 2017. And, you know, Alex explained to me exactly that this was just a way to gather retail deposits and lend it out to traders. And that's where the yield came from. So I ran away from that you know, way back then and would never talk to him again and, you know, didn't even pay attention at all to Celsius until they, you know, basically until I saw that thing about them having yeah. tons of these user funds in Luna. Wow. You know, I just wasn't paying attention. But I, I was vaguely aware in 2021 because I saw the news of their huge fundraising mm -hmm. with Westcap and the pension fund. And then I saw, you know, a month later their CFO got arrested and pulled out of the office. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. was, those are the only two pieces of news that I had tracked on Celsius since like 2017, 2018, until I saw that they had narrowly escaped the Luna Ponzi. Wow. And so, and then it seemed it was one after the next, after the next, yeah, after the next. Exactly. Cause well, they just, they just were sequential mm -hmm. because you know, that was such a part of the Luna story was them, you know, basically having so much of this, what should have been not risky mm -hmm. money that they were holding for customers. Yeah completely at risk in a Ponzi. And then Mashensky started going out and he did an AMA where he basically said that, you know, 30% of all Bitcoins have been lost because Bitcoiners push for self custody, right. which is like an advertisement that writes itself. And that was when I was like, oh my God, this guy's like actively trying to get people to send him money. That can only mean that he has a huge haul. Turns out they actually blew up in spring of 2021 when the GPTC premium flipped. Yeah, right, the arbitrage trade, right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's basically when they first blew a hole in their balance sheet and essentially Westcap came in and saved them, yeah. um, is what I'm told. And, um, and that just rolled straight into FTX because then FTX was supposedly coming in and trying to rescue these CFI lenders that were blowing up. And that makes yeah. no sense. Whenever anybody comes in with this like altruism plan of, you know, wanting to save the industry and you're seeing JP Morgan at crypto, like at minimum, I was like, this guy is clearly lying whenever he talks. 
which was what was obvious whenever you saw Do Kwan talk, it was clear he was lying. When Mashensky talks, mm -hmm. it's obvious this dude's a liar. When, yeah. when Sam Bakeman Fried was talking in, in June, July, it was obvious he was a liar. Yeah. And so I at least wanted to be on record pointing out that this is a lie. And so I started tweeting and doing media appearances and saying like, it's very clear that this guy has a self-serving reason for making bids on these CFI lenders. Right. We may not know what it is, but it ain't for charity and don't listen to him. And that's when I started the don't trust Sam Bankman Freed tagline that was on like 100 tweets through the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think I started calling him Scam Bankman Fraud in mm -hmm. September or October, which ended up getting picked up by the media, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Like, uh, Sam Banks, Scam Bankster Fraud. Scam Bankster Fraud. Scam Bankster Fraud, fraud yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, sort of being confident that I knew this guy was full of shit, uh, I think was why Coindesk got in touch when somebody, pa so somebody passed uh, Ian Allison, one of their editors, the Alameda balance sheet on November 1st, uh, a few months ago. And because I'd been on Coindesk TV a few mm -hmm. times and it helped him with a bunch of stories over the course of the year, uh, he passed it to me and I took him through it and told him what was in it. You know, we talked for about 45 minutes or an hour about this balance sheet, which became the story mm -hmm. that came out the next day. And I have the big block quote, but like the whole article is basically the stuff that I, I told him that I right. saw in it. Um, and that was a very, very quick unravel yep. from there, you know, and I was pretty guarded about what I said. I mean, I really just said like, what this really boils down to is like over two thirds of the net equity in this company is this printed air, printed out of thin air token yeah. that has a, a fair value of zero. Right. That it's should like that should worry you. I think that you'll see the continued sort of advancement. TikTok next block. Bitcoin just continues mm -hmm. to to do its thing, as we say. Bitcoin works, mm -hmm. and that's just what it does. It works as it always has. It's been working for 14 years, and it'll keep on churning out blocks every 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what we'll see is you know there will be at some time in the next five six years, whatever, like some kind of large price move, as there always is. And I think this next this next cohort of people that that feel bitcoin wealthy or have a large percentage of their net worth i think that cohort is going to be large enough that you start to see them demanding medium of exchange services in the west and i think that will be the real sort of crossing the chasm aha moment for people globally and institutions and everybody is to see mm -hmm. oh wow Right. That was a lot more than the hobbyists playing with lightning because they were interested in it or the very mm -hmm. small numbers of people that, you know, got in in 2012, 13, 14 in size and now have most of their net worth in Bitcoin and therefore require those services. Mm -hmm. I think this is what I've always kind of talked about. Like we're still so early in, right. in the adoption of Bitcoin as a, as a store of value to expect us to be right. a widely used medium of exchange uh, this early is, is really unrealistic. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Corey Clipston. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.